A quick bit about one of my favorite subjects and Cycling Weekly's favorite subjects, cadence. Now they've said before, high cadences, bollocks and all the rest of it. So apparently there's a new study, which they actually do fail to link in this article, which really annoys me because I have no idea to verify if this is actually correct because Dr. Federico Formenti has made about 7,000 studies, I reckon, um, on this issue. Uh, but basically what it's saying is they did a, another study on cadence. Not sure how all this gets funding, but apparently it does because cadence is a big thing. And it's basically saying that when they pedal close to their venti ventilatory threshold, which I've looked up and it seems to have a similar de definition to anaerobic threshold, so I'm going to read in sort of lactate threshold, FTP sort of thing. Not sure if it exactly is, but I think it's around that mark. And apparently it was able to see the oxygen level in thigh muscles had fallen compared with lower cadence at the same exercise intensity. Participants' heart rates increased by 15%. Yeah, their efficiency decreased. And let's say nine lab rats. So again, that's a useless study. Nine people is not really enough. Okay, it's not dreadful, but I wouldn't really say it's enough to have a proper study and read a lot of outcomes from it. Sensors detect how much light was absorbed and reflected by hemoglobin. So the scientists calculate how much oxygen was being. And it was basically saying that they might presume that the smoother blood flow at high cadence keeps the exercise and move well oxygenated. They may have been right, but we now know that it comes at the cost of reduced efficiency. So apparently it's less efficient. Um, and then it just says 60% of the power is due to move their legs up and down, while only 40% goes into turning the cranks. Um, and I keep going through, and then we just see some other things that, some studies that I can't seem to find either, uh, which is a bit annoying. But anyway, uh, that is life. And then Dr. Formenti goes on and about just saying how pedaling rate is an important to permanent human VO2 during cycling exercise and should be considered when predicting oxygen consumption. That's how probably they probably get the funding, wasn't it? They probably said, you know, we want to figure out how to get the highest VO2 max, lobbers the funding about cadence, and then they did a completely useless study about it. Um, and then it just says here, Louis Passfield, who I actually do respect, basically said, everyone knows what cadence you should be riding at. So we're gonna to go to uh, Dr. Ferrari's website first, and then we're gonna go into one's actual study. So this is written in like 2012, but we also have some ones from 2003 as well. And it's basically saying at 400 watts, the ideal cadence is 90 to 95. Um, Froome, you know, pedals at 100 RPM, um, and he's saying that he's developed this, and he's saying, you know, when he has really short accelerations, it's 120 to 130. Basically says this is efficient. He then has an article which is written in 2003, and again says that 90 RPM is better, 34% um, on reply. Well, you can read it, the article, I'll try and link it, but if not, it's on 5312.com, um, and then you'll be able to find it. Uh, and he basically just said, high pedaling cadence are favorable to riders. That's effectively what he says, but you need to practice it. So I believe this is a study, I had a look on the internet, but you can see we have some studies from 2015, which are reported recently by Second Weekly. I had a look at this Medical Express website, no studies listed. Um, potentially the study hasn't actually been published, which is why I can't find it. But anyway, I found on this Safe Europe, I think this could be his old study, but it still has, you know, similar, seems a very similar experiment. So anyway, here we go. And he, he seems to like this infrared spectroscopy sort of thing, which uh, I don't know why he thinks is so good. But anyway, go through his little study. No abstract, which has been annoying because it means you actually have to read the whole thing. Uh, introduction, during exercise against constant load, there's a linear increase in oxygen consumption of the muscle with duration of ox exercise. Um, and he's basically just trying to outline what happens when your heart rate goes up, your cardiac output goes up, um, ventilation rate goes up, um, and all the rest of it. So this is basically what it's saying when you increase your oxygen demands. Um, so the introduction will sort of document what they're trying to do. This is their anaerobic th or ventilatory threshold. Um, and then when the anaerobic metabolism comes anaerobic metabolism comes to production of lactate. So it's you know, just setting out the usual things. This is their thing about near infrared. It's basically trying to figure out how much deoxygenation to hemoglobin is and oxygen to hemoglobin is, um, which is all nice. And um, we keep going. So it's basically saying when compared between, so, well, anyway, this doesn't really matter. So the research questions are to examine it, the oxygenation of vastus lateralis at cadence of 30, 50, 70, 90, 110. And this is the more important thing, is that it uses 70-90% of the ventilatory threshold. So this is trying to make it specific to the person instead of just doing random outputs, which often are done where it's just like 150 watts. That could be someone's threshold or it could be someone's like zone one. So I, I do enjoy that, the, well, I do appreciate the fact that they've done this relative to people because cadence is relative to people. So this was 18 subjects, so I reckon, and then it says 12. So I reckon this is his old study, but it's, it's all we've got to go by and we're gonna have a look at what his study has done. Um, uh, saying no alcohol or anything before, um, or no strenuous exercise. Um, but yeah, so we'll go through set up in the lab. This is what they did. I 
don't really like that setup in some ways because, I mean, who rides a bike like that? I would have much preferred if they had a normal bike, but I can understand that the power accuracy probably isn't as much as this lab um, as this lab bike, but anyway, it, it's not ideal. You can also see the, the position of the bottom bracket and things relative to the uh, saddle is probably not ideal. Um, but yeah, so this is the variables they measured, just usual ones, oxygen saturation, um, just trying to show how efficient it is. This is how they figured out the ramp test, um, pretty standard ramp test here uh, to figure out the ventilate, ventilatory threshold. Um, but this is all for amateurs. So here we go, we'll go protocols. This is the sort of exercise they did. So they basically just did some intervals at 70% rest and then they did intervals at 90% and rest um, with a warm up on both times, which is good. Um, but yeah, so average age 29 plus or minus 10. Uh, they only had 10, 12 people studying. Uh, average height 175, average weight 74. So they're pretty fat people to be honest. 70, one, 175, 74 kilos. I'm 173, like 60 something kilos, like 62 kilos. So yeah, they're pretty, pretty heavy people. Um, skin fold thickness, I don't really know that. Um, seven blokes, um, five females. And then this is the thing that pisses me off. Average like threshold is 170 watts. 170 watts divided by 74 kilos is well le is well below three watts per kilo. Like that's okay. Fine, they're amateurs, but I mean for me, I think an amateur is like three to four watts per kilo, maybe three to five watts per kilo in my opinion. I mean like less than three watts per kilo, I feel like that's like untrained sort of beginner style of person. Like it's where it's where the study falls down in my opinion, because even though they try and make it relative to the person, I'm just thinking to myself like, you know, come on, 170 watts at that weight. Mm, I don't know. It, it's, yeah, it's it's not great um, in that respect and not really relevant for a lot of people. I mean, I don't know, I think there are that many people who cycle relatively serious who have a threshold of 170 watts and it's plus or minus 62. So obviously some people are well below, some people are way over as well. So, uh, but the weight isn't actually, the weight is interesting because you've got plus or minus nine centimeters here. So 163 and the lightest person was 62 kilos. So yeah, it's true. I reckon there aren't many people who can, um, yeah, it just seems that everyone's a bit heavy. But I'll go into weight. We'll go back to Dr. Ferrari's article and we'll show you about the weight, why it matters. Um, so this is the cadence, just showing that people were pretty close to their cadence. Obviously, a bit of variance here or there. And here are the tables about heart rate. Obviously, heart rate goes up as your cadence goes up um, for the given power output. Uh, so you can see 90% is the top one, 70% is the second one. Um, lactate goes up as well, which is interesting. You you thought that wouldn't be the case, but that's what his point is, is that it's the efficiency. And you can see the volume of oxygen um, between 30 and 70 is pretty similar, but obviously as you increase your cadence more, you um, your heart rate goes up, so you breathe more. Um, so again, that's, you know, that, that's it. And then you can have RER and RPE, so rate of preserved exertion, <laughs> exertion, exertion. Um, again, it, it does go up as cadence goes up. So you would, I mean, it's no conclusion, which is a bit annoying. But basically what is up, this study is trying to say is that, you know, high cadence is bad because people think it hurts more, heart rate goes up, all the rest of it. But then in my opinion, it's sort of irrelevant because you haven't done it to exhaustion. And I reckon that's probably a better way of doing it is to train people in the cadence and then see if like people trained at 30 cadence or whatever have better, better like time to exhaustion than people at 110 cadence. But the reason I'm gonna go on about weight, and I'll show you it here, is because of this article. Oh, I'm sorry, I've lost it. But anyway, we will find it. Basically, the reason the weight is so important is because your efficiency is massively depends on the weight that you have. Um, so for instance, Chris Froome, like obviously he's super, super light. Um, so he, when he has a high cadence, it's actually far more efficient. And that's another reason why this study is quite, st quite stupid in my opinion. So if we look at, um, if we scroll down here, you'll see this. With his alien mor physical morphology, very thin with long, thin arms and legs, Chris commentates such high cost by minimizing the weight of his rotating limbs. So if you think, if you're a fat sprinter, you think it wouldn't be as efficient to spin, but they all still do spin, which again is why the study is wrong in a quite a lot of ways, because if those people were super lean and super light, it would have been more, um, it would have been, sorry, more efficient um, so yeah, that, that's why I think this study is stupid in two ways. Um, not necessarily stupid. It's not a bad study in terms of the way it was carried out. It's just a bad study in trying to apply it to amateurs, which is what Cycling Weekly over here is trying to do. Because I don't think amateurs, well, maybe they are, maybe I'm just biased, but I think the weight of the amateurs on this is too high. I don't think most people, in terms of the BMI of these people, I don't think it's really like 
it should be less like okay maybe this is for the average population but for an amateur cyclist who's relatively keen i just think it's it's not really like accurate in my opinion um yeah so i'm i don't know and i think the other thing is because it's such a small sample size these numbers here could be like one guy could weigh one one meter 84 and weigh 100 kilos and that would change the weight quite significantly but they didn't i guess they weighed 85 so you can see that there i don't know it, it just it just seems to me that this study isn't relevant for anything apart from the study that was done. I don't think it can be applied in any circumstances saying that high cadence is bad. High cadence, maybe even a threshold of 170 and a BMI of like 27 or like 30 or something is potentially correct. But I think for the majority of people who cycle, their threshold will be higher than that generally. Or if it's not higher than that, they'll probably be light enough that high cadence will matter. And I think the other thing that's slightly maybe misleading um, is that 110 cadence is actually really high and I don't think even pros not many ride at 110 cadence unless they're leading out at like five six hundred watts and that yeah they probably are so I think it, it sort of doesn't really show what like high cadence for most people is over 60 and as you can see from this chart over 60 isn't really a massive penalty at all if anything it's like benefit so I, I would say from this study what you need to guarantee what you need to get out of this study is that basically unless you are this person who's done this test and even then it's not out on the road it's it's just really hard to extrapolate this test and that's why i really wish cycling nuclei didn't keep using these stupid tests and trying to get something out of it because as a like if you if they were more scientific and more of their journalists were scientists they would then look at these studies and be like you just can't take a study of 12 people on some amateurs and just say that is applicable to everyone considering they haven't even done it outside of the lab which how many people cycle inside solely like on an exercise bike it's just it's such a specific thing because you need the results to be so accurate that then in order to extrapolate it so far, it just it just can't be done. But the problem is if you did it outside, there's just too many variables, which so it means you can't do it. The only potential way you could do it is if you did manage to measure VO2 max on the go while doing a hill climb. But on the flat, it, it just wouldn't be possible for amateurs to keep the power so steady. The only way they can keep the power so steady is if you have a, a bike that keeps that power, so they just have to pedal. So yeah, in, in conclusion, don't trust Cycling Weekly in their studies, especially when they don't even cite the study. I mean, it's just a joke. Anyway, cheers for watching. Hope you enjoy this little rant, and I'll see you in the next one.